Every year, millions of tons of copper are produced around the world. This metal is everywhere. In the wires that bring electricity to our homes, in the motors that keep industries running, in electronic circuits, even in the charger for your phone. But how does it go from being rock in the ground to ready to use metal? To answer that, we travel to Chile, specifically to the Atacama region, home to the largest copper mines in the world. First, let's talk about the site. Imagine a vast desert landscape, interrupted only by a massive excavation. Chukikamata. This open pit mine is one of the largest on the planet, stretching for kilometers with deposits reaching depths of up to 100 meters. Here, hundreds of workers, from geologists to heavy machinery operators, work in sync with advanced technology. Everything is designed to move millions of tons of rock each year and extract more than 300,000 tons of copper. But how does the process begin? It all starts with exploration. Geologists study the Earth's crust, analyzing rock and soil samples through drilling and chemical tests. They search for areas where copper is concentrated enough to make extraction worthwhile. In Chukikamata, copper is mostly found in sedimentary rock formed millions of years ago. Once a viable deposit is confirmed, the next step is to bring it out of the ground. And here's something to think about. How much rock do you think is needed to get just one tonne of copper? Keep that in mind, the answer will surprise you. Extraction is where things get intense. To reach the ore, layers of unusable rock, called overburden, must be removed. This requires colossal machinery and explosives. Drill rigs the size of trucks bore around 140 holes, each 16 metres deep. Into each hole goes a mix of ammonium nitrate and fuel, known as ANFO, covered with inert material to control the blast. Then, from a safe distance, the charges are detonated in sequence, just two milliseconds apart. It's like a carefully choreographed dance, every explosion timed to break the rock efficiently without chaos or excessive dust. What happens next? Once the area is secure, after checking gases and stability, giant shovels move in. These machines lift tons of rock in a single scoop, loading it into haul trucks capable of carrying up to 400 tons, about the weight of 300 cars. And here's the answer to that earlier question. To produce one ton of copper, about 200 tons of rock must be moved because the ore contains less than 0.5% copper. All of this is coordinated from a control center that looks like an airport tower. Operators use GPS and cameras to monitor every truck and every shovel in real time, making sure everything runs smoothly. But what we have so far is just rock with traces of copper. So how do we separate the valuable metal from the rest? The extracted ore is divided into two categories, oxides and sulphides, each processed differently. Let's start with oxides, which make up a smaller but important portion. These rocks are piled into massive heaps called leaching pads. They are sprayed with a diluted sulfuric acid solution that slowly trickles through over weeks, dissolving the copper. Think of it as the rock taking a chemical shower where the metal is gradually washed out. The resulting liquid, rich in copper ions, is collected in ponds and sent to a processing plant. At the plant, this solution is mixed with an organic reagent that makes the copper rise to the top separating it from impurities like iron or manganese. Then, an acidic solution is added to concentrate the metal even further and prepare it for electro-winning. This is where things get fascinating. Copper begins to deposit onto thin sheets called cathodes. When electric current is applied, copper ions stick to these plates and, in just over a week, each one grows to about two and a half centimeters thick and weighs around 130 kilos. The result is copper with nearly 100% purity, perfect for electrical wires and components, where even the slightest impurity could cause problems. Now, let's move on to sulphides, which make up the majority of the ore in mines, like Chukikamata. This process is more complex. It all begins in a massive drum called the primary mill, where steel balls crush the damp rock into smaller fragments. Think of it as an industrial blender, but for stone. The crushed material passes over perforated screens that separate the fine particles from the larger ones. The bigger pieces go back into the mill for another round until everything is reduced to a fine powder, almost like sand. 
So, how is copper separated from this powder? The answer lies in a process called flotation. Chemicals are added to coat the copper particles, along with a foaming agent. Then, in flotation tanks, air is injected to create bubbles that carry the copper to the surface, as if the particles were tiny buoys floating in a sea of rock. The copper-rich foam is skimmed off and filtered, producing a concentrate with about 30% purity. This concentrate is dried to make it easier to transport. From there, the concentrate often travels by train to a smelting plant, sometimes located miles away. Here, it is mixed with silica sand, a material that helps remove impurities. In furnaces that reach 1200 degrees Celsius, the mixture melts into a glowing liquid. Impurities like iron form a slag that floats and is removed, leaving copper at about 60% purity. Picture it like separating cream from milk. The slag is the leftover and the copper is what we want. The copper then moves to a second furnace where oxygen is injected to burn off additional impurities, raising the purity to 98%. The remaining slag is poured out like a river of lava, cooled with water and solidified, sometimes reused for construction. The molten copper then goes to another furnace for a final purification reaching 99.4%. It is poured into moulds to form large rectangular slabs called anodes, which are cooled with water and cleaned to remove any residue. But we're still not done. Those anodes head to a refinery where they are submerged in tanks containing sulfuric acid and copper sulphate, facing thin cathodes. When electric current is applied, pure copper detaches from the anodes and deposits onto the cathodes while impurities such as gold or silver fall to the bottom as sludge that can be collected and refined into other valuable metals. The final result, copper with 100% purity, ready to become part of the products we use every day. So, how does this pure copper become part of your daily life? The cathodes are shipped to wire factories, where they are melted in furnaces at over a thousand degrees. The molten metal is cast into long bars, which are cooled and rolled into rods about 7 mm thick. These rods are coiled onto reels, ready for the next step. At the factory, the rods are stretched even further through progressively smaller dies in a process called wire drawing. Imagine passing a piece of dough through a pasta maker, but with metal. At the end, you get wire less than a millimeter thick, cooled with water and wound into coils. With just one kilo of copper, you can make about 40 metres of standard wire, enough to cross a football field several times. To turn that wire into electrical cables, multiple strands are twisted together, making them more flexible and durable. Then, in machines called extruders, they are coated with molten plastic, such as PVC, forming an insulating layer. This plastic can be coloured red, blue or green to indicate its role in a circuit. The cable then passes through a cold water bath to harden the insulation and sensors check for any defects. For advanced cables, extra layers like metallic shielding or steel armour are added for protection against interference or damage. But before we close this first chapter, did you know copper is also used in something as different as guitar strings? Its flexibility and ability to transmit vibrations make it ideal for musical instruments. And if copper has such surprising versatility, silver is not far behind. Every year, thousands of tons of this shiny metal are produced worldwide. It is used in electronic circuits, solar panels, medical components, jewellery, and even essential parts for the space industry. But where does this brilliant metal, which has accompanied humanity for centuries, actually come from? To find out, we travel to Mexico, the world's top silver producer, and descend into one of its mines. It all begins 400 metres underground, in the depths where silver forms naturally. Geologic history is key here. Millions of years ago, geothermal activity and tectonic collisions created mineral-rich veins. In places like Potosí in Bolivia or Proaño in Mexico, these veins can be as thick as three and a half metres. But how are they located with precision? That's where geologists step in equipped with gamma ray guns and other advanced tools. They analyze the rocks for metallic signatures, detecting up to 40 different elements. Silver doesn't appear in its shiny, polished form. Instead, 
it shows up as a dark grey mineral embedded in the rock. It's as if the Earth were hiding a secret, one only experts can decode. Once a deposit with potential is found, the next step is to evaluate it thoroughly. Samples are taken to measure how much silver exists in each kilogram of rock. This stage is decisive. If the concentration is too low, it is not worth investing in such an expensive excavation. Think of it like planning a long trip. Before setting off, you check the map and the weather, because there's no sense in leaving without knowing what lies ahead. In places like Proaño, Mexico, exploration never really stops, since deposits stretch across 15 kilometers at multiple underground levels. When studies confirm that extraction is worthwhile, preparation begins. Miners head deep into damp, dusty tunnels, enduring heat and harsh conditions, yet working with absolute precision. Using laser systems, they mark the richest zones and drill holes barely 12 centimetres in diameter. Each hole is carefully loaded with just the right amount of explosives. The calculation depends on the density of the rock and its depth, ensuring maximum recovery of material without risking collapses. The next step is detonation. Each blast is a carefully engineered event. No chaos, everything under control. When the calculations are correct, thousands of tons of rock are loosened in an orderly way. In a single day, up to 7,000 tons can be extracted. What happens to all that material? Once dislodged, it drops through chutes into underground trains that carry it to a central point. From there, loaders bring it to the surface. Outside, geologists review and mix the piles, making sure the silver concentration is uniform. It's like adjusting a recipe, balancing the ingredients, so the final product maintains the same quality every time. At the surface, transformation begins. The first stop is the crusher, massive steel jaws that break the rocks into manageable fragments. This step is essential because oversized pieces cannot be processed efficiently. From there, a conveyor belt carries the material to the ball mill, huge cylinders filled with steel spheres. As they spin, the rock is ground into a fine pulp a kind of mineral slurry ready for the next phase. Now comes the key process, flotation. The slurry is mixed with water and chemical reagents inside large tanks. These reagents generate bubbles that cling to the valuable minerals, like silver, lifting them to the surface, while the waste sinks to the bottom. Thanks to this method, the silver concentration can increase up to 30 times compared to the original rock. Still, this doesn't happen instantly. The process takes around three days, with the mixture constantly agitated to efficiently separate what's useful from what's not. The silver-enriched solution then moves to filter presses. Here, filters treated with zinc-based compounds capture the silver particles, forming a precipitate that contains about 50% silver and 50% residual material. Zinc is used because of its ability to chemically bond with silver, making it a highly effective precipitant. The material is dried in gas-fired ovens and laboratory technicians constantly test samples to measure purity. Every kilogram is analysed in detail to ensure it meets quality standards before continuing. The next stage is smelting. The dry precipitate is placed into crucibles heated to extreme temperatures. Silver, being denser than the waste, sinks to the bottom and separates from unwanted materials. The molten metal is then poured into moulds to form ingots, which solidify in minutes. These first ingots already have significant purity, enough for many applications, but for more demanding uses, they still need further refining. That refining happens in large-scale industrial facilities. Here, huge volumes of silver are processed with advanced technology. The ingots are heated to over 800 degrees Celsius, allowing impurities like lead and other unwanted metals to be removed through oxidation. This process is repeated several times until the result is a metal that is nearly pure. Next comes the separation of silver and gold through an electrolytic method. Metal plates are submerged in a silver nitrate solution and, when an electric current is applied, the silver dissolves and deposits onto the negative electrode, while the gold remains on the positive. This process achieves 100% purity and the final ingots can reach a value of nearly $1,000 each. Yet their true worth lies not only in the metal itself, 
but in the countless ways it is transformed and used in modern life. Today, silver is far more than a precious metal for ingots or jewellery. Its exceptional electrical and thermal conductivity makes it an essential component in virtually every electronic device. Every mobile phone, computer, gaming console and television contains silver in its circuits and connectors. In the field of energy, silver is indispensable. It is used in solar panels to efficiently and reliably conduct the electricity generated by sunlight and in high-performance batteries, including those powering electric and hybrid vehicles. Even in emerging technologies, from sensors to artificial intelligence hardware, silver plays a silent but critical role. Its reflective properties also make it highly valuable in glass coatings and mirrors. Modern buildings use silver layers in windows and facades to reflect light and heat, helping reduce energy consumption in climate control. This turns silver into a key material not only for technology, but also for energy efficiency and sustainability. Medicine is another field where silver proves its importance. Thanks to its antibacterial properties, it is used in surgical instruments, wound dressings, and even in certain water treatment systems. This makes it vital for hospitals, clinics and laboratories striving to maintain hygiene and prevent infections. Even in household appliances and water purifiers, small amounts of silver help keep surfaces and liquids free of bacteria. Historically, silver has been a cornerstone resource for centuries. Mexico and Bolivia were major producers during the colonial era, fueling entire economies. In the 16th century, Bartolomé de Medina's method, which used mercury and copper sulfate, revolutionized silver extraction, making production more efficient. Potosí alone supplied up to 80% of the world's silver for three centuries. Minting coins, such as the peso de aocho, considered the first universal currency. Although today's methods are modern and safe, the legacy of those processes still echoes in the global importance of silver. And that is how copper and silver are produced two metals that have stood as pillars of human progress. Tell me, what did you think of the process? Share your thoughts in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. In the windows you see next, you'll find more videos that might capture your interest. Go ahead and watch one. See you next time.